a topic, and Jez, I could just see who's just popped up here. I know he's very hot on this one, is recruitment, Jordana. Uh, you mentioned it in the news about some of the stats. Just take us back over some of the things that you found out in there and just highlight a couple of those bits because I, I want to talk off uh, a couple of those things that you brought up in the news. So for me, the most staggering, staggering uh, percentage was 45% increase of hairdressers and beauty salon businesses between 2017 and 2020. And obviously that means that we're all competing. There's a salon and a hair barbershop every third store in central London. So we're, we're competing for clients like we've never seen before, which means that maybe the weaker links or the slightly older salons or the slightly unstable salons are going to close. And for me, I think, I think that's the biggest change I've seen because a lot of my, you know, when my parents tell stories about their, you know, their hairdressing days, it's really, really clear how different it was. And the power was really in the hairdresser's hands. Whereas now we are try we are just getting every client that we can. And every client to us is like gold dust. We don't have the opportunity that we used to where we can turn people away or we're so busy that we can't fit you in. Mm. Um, it's just not the way things are anymore. There may be people who still pretend it's like that, but I can guarantee you that when you have an honest and frank conversation with any salon owner, they'll say the same thing. Competition is so high and it's scary. So every time I get people selling to me, you know, I'm opening a salon, I'm opening a business. When I say good luck, I really mean good luck because it's tough. It is really tough. Yeah. And if you're going to do it, have a good old think or chat to your boss and maybe have some kind of partnership thing like what John Lewis do, you know, and you can be a stakeholder or something like that. But if you, if you're doing it on your own, you need, you need to really think about it because it's, it's a big journey and particularly with, you know, these figures might increase. Who knows in 2021, there'll be even more salons. We don't know. And then the second thing that I really picked up on was there's a right, there's a drop in of a 13% uh, in overall applications for the hairdressing apprenticeship scheme. Now, on my stories today on Instagram, I put the, um, the Journey to My Destination, which is a documentary that Sally Brooks, who's ex-British Hairdresser of the Year, has released. And it's a really, really cool documentary. And the purpose of it was basically to kind of encourage young people in hairdressing to join. And it was to show you the weird and wonderful things that hairdressing can take you and the places it can take you as well. And it's not just about life behind the chair. So... If you can, have a, have a watch of it. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, I think it's free if you've got Prime, but if you haven't, then you have to pay, I think, two ninety nine. It's a really good documentary, and I've been taking it around to the local schools because it's such an easy watch. And um, it's got some really cool hairdressing names in there as well. Mm. I mean, this is important, isn't it, George? I mean, uh, again, uh, just yes or no, are you got problems recruiting right now whether that's stylist apprentices put that in the comments here let's see are you having issues with recruiting um i think how we promote the industry and there has been lots of different schemes about talking about you know the the different pathways my podcast you've got uh, creative head the industry what they're doing and journey to my destination lots of people are doing this and they're trying to promote the industry but is it really getting over the real message george well i, I mean i have to say you know i think there's less and less that that you know empl employed salons are on a slight decline aren't they and there's more and more freelancers so if we've got more and more freelancers and people going freelance and self-employed and stuff like that who's going to be training the assistants that's the thing um and i also want to speak about school leavers you know sometimes i think and i'm not saying i will not welcome it's taken me a long time to find my apprentices the right apprentices for my business um, and i think that maybe it shouldn't be a simple case of doing a college course i think it should be more i think there should be like two years on the salon floor after that and actually i i just find a lot of young kids to get up and go has got up and gone and I don't, and sometimes I don't think that they're mentally equipped to be in a in a busy salon. Sometimes mm. I find it very difficult. And sometimes, as a business owner, I would rather take on an older apprentice and pay more than have somebody at sixteen that just hasn't got that maturity or 
yeah. you know, confidence about That's them. really interesting you said that because I actually had somebody DM me and uh, who was an older hairdresser wanted to get into apprenticeship and she wanted my advice on what my thoughts were. And I actually just said exactly what you said. But unfortunately, salons don't want to pay for older apprentices, Giordano. Isn't that the case? And, you know, it, it, it seems to stop older people coming into the industry because of that problem. Well, you say that, but actually, at any age, if someone joins you as an apprentice, so long as you're paying them above minimum wage, for the first year, you can get away with still, you know, in, in guidelines with the apprenticeship scheme. But it's after that first year is up, that's where you have to put their, their prices right up to above minimum wage. Um, and it's and it's kind of, it gives you a year to think, are they, are they worth it? Is there a potential partnership here? So I don't have problems taking on older staff members, but I also do think that we, it's our duty of care to make sure that the 15 year olds or the 16 year olds who are coming in don't necessarily get a free ride but that we adapt to the way they the way that they work now. They, they're not going to come there with a work ethic. They're not going to start from day one with the best attitude. We have to coach them. And sometimes you just have to give them that extra, extra help, or extra mentorship, or sometimes three or four chances, or six or seven disciplinary meetings, if that's what it takes. Um, because personally, I found doing that and sticking by them does pay off sometimes <laughs> hmm. and especially when you know you know you know that they're not coming in you know that the applications are not coming in thick and fast so i always try and work with what i've got because you never know when the next application is going to come through yeah i'm just going to pick this one up hi you saffron how you doing she says i can't find any good experienced stylist i'm now home growing my own got three apprentices at the moment great idea george if you can do Amazing. that and get them all the way through yeah, hundred percent. I think if you want, if you want to create, especially, especially if you want to create a brand, the only way to do that is to homegrown. Because I think if you're looking for experienced stylists, the problem is, you know, we are hairdressers, we are divas and dudes, right? So if you've got an experienced stylist, with that can come people setting the ways, not willing to change, not willing to do the techniques that the business is doing. So, yeah, I think homegrown is the way forward, but it can be quite financially difficult. Yeah. And you can see a lot of years paying a lot of apprentice wages and, you know, living on pot noodles yourself. It's not all that sometimes over in the business. I'm really going to put it out there. Hard. What could a really good, successful stylist be earning? I, I don't actually. What what is what could an experienced hairstylist in a good salon be earning? What employed or self-employed? Employed. I reckon good money. I'll just good leave money. it at that. Good money. Not, well, what's good money then? Come on, I, I'm I'm interested. I want to know. I want to know if I want to come and work with you guys. <laughs> I'm not saying you guys actually, but what is a good wage for a hairdresser? I'd say anything above for London. If you're taking above two and a half grand, then you're doing well per month. Mm. Okay. Well, since, and I would say since opening, one of my top earners is earned nearly nine grand, and he's self-employed, and he, he takes sixty yeah. percent of that. So that's pretty good. This is the problem, isn't it? Well, it's a, is it a problem or it, it does look again? This is a big, big topic, and it's one we can talk about, self-employed. The rise of self-employed hairdressers are becoming greater. And is there a reason? Because there is maybe a bit more freedom, as they see, and they can earn greater money than maybe being employed in salons. I'm not saying that's the case, but you just saying that, George, it's sounding to me that the self-employed hairdressers earning some good money. Mm. Yeah. 100%. And, and they do, we do a lot of training together. We work as a little, we do work as a little team. We're always showing each other. And, you know, I think there's a lot more self-employed uh, places that are doing that. Having said that, you know what, I would, I would love to employ. I would love to employ. Hmm. Um, and I think the next few people I take on, my apprentices are going to be coming on as an employed basis because I feel like if you really want to make a difference and you really want to create a family and you really want to create a brand, and I'm not saying my, myself and employed lot don't do that because they do, I think that employed is a good business structure, mm. but it's just harder 
Yeah. Financial what what, what do you guys think? Are you for self-employed, employed? I know when I interviewed Matthew Sutcliffe, and we've referenced Matthew quite regularly from Tint, and I quite liked his approach that, you, I think he started off with actually employing and it gives you the option to then become self-employed as a promotion within your salon. Is is mm. this, it's quite a professional setup because this is the problem with self-employed. It has this reputation of being just back alley, prof, unprofessional, um, but there, it seems to me that it's growing up, Jordana, self-employed and that's, you know, are, are salons doing it correctly and doing it the right way? Well, I would say, I would say personally, it should be um, a benefit that you 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 earn. So perhaps you were you start as employed at a salon for let's say four or five years. You build up your clientele. You soak as much from that salon as possible, and then when you hit that ceiling, which everyone does around the age of thirty five. You, you'll get to art director level. You can't increase your prices any higher. Where can you go? You deserve a pay rise every couple of years or every year. You deserve a pay rise. So the only place you can go is if you switch to self-employed and you could literally be in control and take a lot more money than you are because we're saving on that 20% PAYE contribution. And of course, there's lower tax thre tax thresholds. So that for me is the way to do it. You hit a ceiling price, then they get the benefit of becoming self-employed with you. Yeah, I'm just going to yeah. flag up here, Robert. Uh, her, I'm actually doing my salaries now. My employed staff member is going to be paid eight and a half thousand pounds. Yeah, can I go work for Rob, please? Rob, I tell <laughs> you, my man, we're all queuing. It, it's you know you've got to and, and Andrew here. Hey, Andrew, uh, got to pay top dollar uh, for self uh, for employees, or they will go self-employed, and rightfully so. You can't argue with that, can you? No. You know, you, you, you just, and, and I think also while we're on it, I've got to bring this up and I've, it's the pathway in our industry, right? This I think is a problem. If you're an architect, right, and you work for an architect and you, you stay in that job because you generally, it's quite hard for you to go home and start designing houses for your mum and your aunt and all her friends. And before you know it, you're just doing it at home. You, the jobs are quite rare does that make sense but i think sometimes with hairdressing and barbering uh, there are always opportunities you know if you do lose a job you can quite easily go and find a place somewhere else is that a fair comment george yeah i think you know what we we've all it's a trade that you can literally take anywhere isn't it um but i do feel like i do think people like to feel part of something and I do think we are creative people so I do think it's nice to have that vibe where you're creating something together mm. yeah I mean, I don't... Like, take Rob Salon for instance he's just amazing at avant-garde and it's, it's like it, people are people are taking salons and they're creating a movement mm. and I do think that you know money money matters but for me money isn't everything and to be part of that movement I think is it's something really special and I think it's something that you don't necessarily get in every industry. Mm. Look, I, I, I don't want to get too drawn because I can feel we're going self-employed, employed. It, it's a dangerous subject because I think that there's advantages on both sides and and, and I think there is. I think it's really hard to sort of diss self-employed and diss employed. It's about what actually suits you and a salon. It, it, I think ultimately it's about professionalism. That's what it's about. If you're professional, great. That's for me. I'm I'm more concerned about recruitment, and I'm concerned about recruiting people into our industry right now. With uh, us, where Jordana? I have a question for George while we're on the topic. Topic just before we move on. Um, Robert has said, "I'm not for self-employed. You have zero control over your business and client experience." Would you say that's true, George? And if so, how have you overcome that? Um, yeah, I would say that, that, yeah, by law, absolutely, that's true. But we've been friends for a long time um, and we all get on and we've got a really close net team mm -hmm. So because we've known each other for a long time. Um, I think when you're getting self-employed and you're maybe just recruiting people and you don't know them and you haven't built that relationship, we've been, we've been through three salons, some of us together, over the last 10 years. And I think that that makes 
a difference. Yeah. You know, and I think that makes what, a difference. What, can I be cheeky and ask what the going rate is for self-employed? What's the ratio that you you split it between? Well, you can either do share rental, or you can, which would be a flat flat out rate for the day, or you can do a percentage base, and I get 45% and they get 55%, apart from my top earners, they get a little bit more, and they provide everything, all the stock and everything for that. Mm. Cool. Okay, so it, if, if I was to join your salon, would I be able to use your products? No. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, you, we do have a set of products that we agree on together, but we all get our own. Where are you going here, Jordana? I feel you're going somewhere with this. No, no. <laughs> Don't set me up on a, for, for a fall on me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, again, yeah. you know, I've interviewed some incredible uh, owners of self-employed salons, and I, I've got to be totally honest, if I didn't have my own establishment and would I go and work for somebody or would I be self-employed? I would be self-employed. For me personally, because I would be, uh, it doesn't mean that I don't want to work hard or be part of a team or be part of training. I think that's a poor excuse. I actually think the vast majority, you're going to tell people like Carolyn Chapman that they're uh, Ashley Hodges, that they're unprofessional, they don't want to be part of the team. It's nonsense. And actually, it's about the people you've got coming into your place. So there is a place for all. And, you know, we can talk about, you know, having control over self-employed business. I think you try controlling employed people as well. So I'm sitting on the fence here. I'm not, honestly, I, I think some people want to be their own people in control of their destiny. I think we just need to have better choices for people. I want to have better establishments for people that want to be self-employed. And, you know, they don't want to be back alley. They are passionate hairdressers who want to get trained so um we've gone into that self-employed i didn't want to particularly go on that i did want to ask how are we going to recruit more people into the industry because that is a bigger picture and i think we're going to have to hold that for another uh, week because it's a big topic so um you know has anybody found something that's really been successful for them in recruiting staff uh, i'd be really interested to know uh Jordana, I feel like the teacher at the front of the class. Yes, Jordana, you may speak. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, since Sally came out with her documentary, I had zero juniors at one point, and I've got, there's 30 of us at the salon, so we were desperate. And I, I took the DVD and I went and booked myself into all the local uh, schools around my area in Croydon. Even though it's still far from Kensington, I just thought I need to try this. So then I got into their career days and I did six visits around Croydon area um, in, over the space of like three months. And it was amazing. They gave me like an hour and a half slot. I literally played parts of the um, DVD, the documentary. And I did this whole workshop with them. And I talked about all the different things and the, the different places that a hairdressing or barbering career can take you. And I was talking to like year 11 or year 10. Um, so people that probably should, you know, be thinking about apprenticeships. And I got quite a few people um, come and actually do like a, a work experience day with me. And no, it didn't actually turn into full-time employment because for whatever reason, but I got like three or four, day, three or four days of, of work experience. And I think I spread the message quite well. So that could be something if you're not too strapped for time to consider. I think we do need to go into local schools and inspire them because otherwise, what have they got to go off? I, and I'm going to jump in there, right? So this, and thank you, Rami. It's a great content tonight. And that's what we want is this is the hairdresser show. You know, this is for us to hang out and let's have our rants and raves here. You know, this is our place. We talk about schools and actually I think we get a lot of kids actually coming into hairdressing. I actually truthfully feel we are getting them in. I don't think we're doing a good enough job of actually keeping them. And I had a great conversation. She heads up the curriculum at a very good college. She got in touch with me and she wanted to talk to me. And she, she was saying that the problem is they're not getting engaged enough. So when you look at school leavers, quite often not i'm not saying look many of us go into hairdressing because we're passionate about it but because we have to keep in education until we're 18 what am i going to do do hairdressing okay and probably a lot of them don't want to do hairdressing so you lose them colleges lose them lose them money we've got to do a better job i feel of the ones that we get into the industry because you can tell all the kids in the world how wonderful it is 
But if they go into a salon, and to be quite honest, it's absolutely dire, we feel like we're going to be lying to them. And there are lots of dire salons out there, George. Yeah, no, 100%. We've got a lot of competition. Um, there's a lot of salons around. Um, so, yeah, there is. You've got to be got yeah. a good business model. Susan, hi, Susan. Patrick, uh, Susan is part of the Patrick Cameron team. It's always good to have Susan here. Patrick has always presented motivational seminars in schools. Students loved it. And and I know Emma Brady, she does... She, the, uh, what's happened to that? Is that about Choose Hair campaign? Uh, I think that kind of... Is it still there? Yeah, Susan, again, says, brilliant idea, Jordana. By the way, we are about 20 seconds delay, so I am a little bit later on there. But, oh, it's a good conversation, isn't it, ladies?